Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Akif, uh, and today we're going to talk about <coughs> a disjoint set union. Uh, this data structure is also known as disjoint set forest or disjet, disjoint set find, um, and it's a pretty cool data structure, I think, in my opinion. Okay, uh, so we assume that we have some sort of uh, buckets, and these buckets all have objects in them, and each object is in some different bucket. Okay, so we have a collection of buckets. Um, and the goal is, to, if you want to, we want to be able to check whether or not two objects are in the same bucket or not. Additionally, we also want to be able to merge two buckets. So if you have two buckets, we want to empty one bucket into the other bucket. Um, and then also, after that, be able to check if the, the two objects are in the same bucket like before. So these two types of operations, and they need to be able to happen. Okay. Uh, does everyone understand what, what this is? This is this is the problem set up for what DSU solves. I think it's pretty clear, but does everyone understand? And usually what you'll do is you'll start out with every element in its own bucket and then do operations from there. Okay, cool. So let's go on. Okay, so one way to do it um, is very simple, at, at, uh, at the surface level at least. Um, and that's to always merge the smaller bucket into the larger bucket. So if, if you're merging two buckets, right, for merging bucket one and bucket two, uh, this sort of rule says that you should take the smaller bucket and empty it into the bigger bucket. Um, and so specifically what that means is that we, we sort of take the smaller bucket and loop over all its objects and then insert them into, whatever, into the larger uh, bucket, whatever data structure we happen to be using to represent each bucket. Um, uh, when we do this, if an object is moving from one bucket to another, that means that the size of the bucket that contains it has at least doubled, right? Um, this means that each object can only move log n times at most uh, throughout like the entire entirety of what happens, right? Uh, once it's moved log n times, the bucket that it's in is the entire universe, right? And it can't move any longer. Um, thus, uh, no matter what operations we do and what order we do them in, right? We uh, we only have to do n log. We only are forced to do n log n movements of objects from one bucket to another in total. So, for example, if you represent buckets like vectors or whatever, uh, this just means that we uh, that that uh, we at most across our operations have n log n um, pushbacks or whatever. Or if we, uh, I guess we need to, yeah. And, and or if we use a set, it's uh, at most n log n set inserts. Um, if we want to use set to be able to do the check part fast. So this is kind of cool that this actually works so nicely. Um, however, uh, in day-to-day -day, uh, competitive programming, we don't actually use this method um, for a variety of reasons, which I'll get into. But we, we actually use a different method. Okay, um, And that method is to represent our buckets or disjoint sets um, as trees. Uh, and by the way, I guess I didn't mention this before, but the, the, the disjoint sets in the title refers to these different buckets. They're, they're sets of objects, and they're all disjoint. Uh, because no object is in two buckets at once. Okay, uh, so the idea is to use trees like this. Um, so we represent each set or bucket as a tree. Then to check if whether, let's say in this case, right, you want to check whether two or two and four are in the same bucket or not, right? Uh, we do a traversal to the root. So we traverse two to the root, which is one. We traverse four's tree to the to the root, which is three, and check whether the roots are the same. In this case, they're not. So two and four are in different buckets. However, when we want to merge two trees, what we do is we take one of the roots and make it a child of the other. For example, here we're merging um, two and three, two and four, right? Let's say. So we look at the root. So the root of two is one. Root of four is three. Then we take arbitrarily, we take three and make it the child of one, right? We took one root and we made it the child of the other root. Now, in this case, if we do another check operation on two and four. 2 goes to 1, and 4 traverses also all the way up to 1. And they have the same root, so they're in the same bucket. The sort of way you want to think about it is that the root of your uh, tree is a representative element of that bucket or set. And ch what check does is if it checks whether or not the representative elements of two objects are the same. Okay? Everyone get how we're representing stuff? Okay, cool. Um, however, this sort of oh wait. Okay, cool. Yeah. However, uh, this setup is by itself not efficient enough. 
it's conceivable that through some series of merge operations, uh, depending on which way you merge it, um, one of the trees becomes like a stick of size n or so. Um, and then all your find operations will also take all in time. And then you're at n squared, and that's everything's blowing up. So what we do is we use something called path compression. What this does is that when you call find, um, uh, what this relies on is that when you call find, we check the path to the root, right? Remember on the last slide, whenever we call find, the whole trick was that, oh, uh, we're, we're going to the top, right? When we're checking whether or not two objects are in the same bucket, we're checking, we're calling find for finding the root of each element, right? So for example, for seven, if you call find seven to find its representative element, we go all the way to the top. We go five, three, two, one, right? Um, and so the idea for path compression is that we take this path to the root and we make all of the elements on that path direct children of the root. So if you see here, we took s this path, seven, five, three, two, one, and we made seven, three, five, two, all children of one directly. So the idea of this is that it makes a tree very shallow and very quickly. Um, and it turns out, I'm not going to go over the analysis now, but it turns out that throughout this, your, a series of find and join operations of n of them will take uh, O n log n time approximately. And so this means that each operation is only log n time amortized. Um, the interesting, the really interesting thing is that if you do this and also do the union by rank thing from before where you merge small to big, um, uh, so, so here, right, so if you're merging uh, two sets, right, we, we take the smaller guy guys, um, uh, we have two roots, right, two representative elements for two buckets, we take the smaller tree and make it the child of the root of the bigger tree. If we do that always, um, then each operation amortized doesn't take log n time anymore. It takes what's called log star n. Um, this is called the iterated logarithm, and it's very, very slow to grow, like extremely slow. Uh, I think uh, Wikipedia mentions that for any si size of number that fits in the observable universe, uh, it, goes, it grows up to like four or something. So that's really cool. Um, and that means that you don't. That means this is basically constant time for any practical size in competitive programming. That being said, we don't usually do this thing because usually we don't care about that log n factor. However, it's nice to know that if at some point you have to sort of efficient, if to make your code more efficient and scrape away a log factor, uh, this option is available to do this union by rank and make your DSU much much faster. Okay, uh, so now we're going to talk about implementation. Um, because it seems like this whole idea of using trees and stuff is very complicated, um, and uh, at least to some degree, and might, might make things harder than just using the small to large merging. However, there's a very nice way to represent it. Um, and the idea is that we store this tree data structure, not in the traditional way where we have this graph of children, um, but rather just an array where each element is the parent of that index. So if you look here, um, uh, oh, and that's right, I forgot to mention, and additionally what we do is we have we make roots of the tree, the representative elements, have themselves as the parents, right? Um, so if you look here, right, we have five, for example. Five is just itself. So five has itself as parent, and that's it. If you look at this set, eight and one are children of six, right? So they have six as, parent, as their parents. So eight is six as a parent, one is six as a parent, and six obviously is six as a parent because it's at, it's at the root. But right here, seven is a child of nine. So seven is nine is his parents. And you know, you, you, you guys can figure it out. Um, and so the idea here is that if we want to get this representative element, get the root, all you have to do is recursively just call the parent. Just get parent of parent of parent of parent of parent of i, and so on and so forth, until you reach a root element, which you can tell by the fact that it stops changing. Um, and the way you merge stuff is that you just set the parent of one root to the other. Remember, that was the whole point, right? You make one root the child of the other. Um, in the array format, all that corresponds to is just setting parent i equal to the root of the other guy. Right? Uh, everyone see what the idea is here? Yeah. Feel free to interrupt at any time, by the way. Okay, cool. Uh, so actual code now. So this is the template for fine. It's as I, as I mentioned before, uh, this is actually really really cool to implement. Um, even though we're using all these tree all this tree stuff, uh, the template is incredibly short. Uh, in fact, normally uh, we just write in one line like this with a ternary, and it's incredibly short to type. Um, and this is one of the reasons we use it over this small to large merging. Usually, is because of how easy it is to implement and use. 
Okay, um, so when you ha once we have this find thing, right? Remember, find whole point of find is to get the representative element of any bucket. Um, then check becomes incredibly simple. Uh, if you want to check if A and B are in the same bucket, all you have to do is just set check if the representative elements are the same, uh, aka find A equals find B. And as I mentioned before, merging, right, is you're setting one uh, uh, root, the root of one guy, to the child of the root of the other guy, right? So we take find the root, set its parent to the root of the other guy, and, and that's it. Uh, so this is very nice. Um, and often the idiom you'll see um, is that you'll check if two objects are in the same bucket. If they are, you handle that case and do something special depending on the problem. Um, and if they're not, then you merge them and do something special depending on the problem. And that's, that's what you see. Everyone understand how this code is working, by the way? Uh, I, I guess I didn't explain the template. It's kind of like, easy, but I should explain it. So this check condition, right, checks if A is a root, right, because the whole point of root is if it equals, if its parent is itself. And if it's a root, then the root of itself is just itself, right? Otherwise, oops, otherwise we return the root of its parent, right? We, we're doing the traversal up to the top. Um, and while we do that, we also do the path compression, right? We're making the tree shallower by setting the parent of A directly to be the root of this entire bucket. So, so we're making the tree shallower as we go, and hopefully making the queries faster from then on. Okay? And then the one other thing to keep track of is to make sure you initialize all of the parents to themselves for most problems. Because most of the time you want to start them off all in different buckets. So you set all their parents equal to themselves. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, let's do a bunch of problems now. Okay, okay so first problem is called vessels. So we have this structure on the right with uh, n vessels, where n is like up to 10 to the fifth or something. Um, and each vessel has some volume AI. And you can see these vessels like stacked on top of each other, right? Um, and you're given a bunch of queries, uh, 10 of the fifth queries, let's say. And so there's two types of queries. Uh, the first type is that you add some out of water X to vessel number P. The other type of query is you want to ask how much water is in vessel number K. Uh, and by the way, for the first query, if the vessel gets full, filled up, the remaining water just falls down and cascades down to the next one. If that one gets full, it cascades down to the next one, and, and so on and so forth. Right? Okay, so uh, I guess I'll give you guys a few minutes to think about any, any observations problem or solutions. Hint, you're supposed to use ESU for this. Wait, when something fills up, it, the it's not the whole vessel collapses, right? Only the extra water flows yeah, down? Yeah, only the extra water flows down. Then I, I'm not sure why we need DSU for this instead of just each query, just you add it to uh, the value. And then like you just add it to the next one when it fills up. Mm. Like if you just have an array for that stores the amount in each bucket, then you... To add, you just add to that spot in the array, and if it's full, you just go over and put it in there instead. Uh, right, but what what if you go over to the next one and that one's full, and then oh, if that one's full, you go to the next one. Oh, what if that one's full, and you do that like a huge amount of times, right? That could be a squared. I or, guess or you could keep track of the uh, if if you do have an overflow, you can like flag it, I guess, and then like point to the lowest one. Right. <laughs> that, uh, that, that you're getting closer to, yeah that, that's you're getting closer to the solution with that um yeah i'm not I, sure if the exact dsu is strictly necessary yeah. you, you might be able to get away without it um by some yeah, like fancy yeah. track of like which things but dsu makes it really really easy to code um and it's this I mean, idea behind it yeah. the pointer thing you're describing sounds a lot like dsu oh yeah, it's um, like partially dsu but partially yeah. dsu just fill it in you know until you get to that part I don't think you need the yeah, full DSU. Really the need. Sure, yeah, go. Uh, I yeah, I don't really see the need for the tree structure. I mean, uh, you could just uh, make a, make a linked list or something, and then use uh, and then use union that way. And then you don't really need to worry about uh, storing elements or anything. Just uh, just have uh, just have one value, which is the number, and then when you're when you're merging two elements in the linked list, just add the two uh, capacities together. Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, that's, that's... 
Uh, I think that that, that also uh, that would also works. Yeah, you don't need the full uh, DSU structure, but you need something similar to that. You need to maintain the components and mm-hmm. have the linking. It's just that the tree structure will often just, as you said, end up being a link list, uh, basically. Um, but the, as I mentioned before, the DSU makes it very easy to code. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just go over the, the solution, which is exactly basically what you guys are saying. Um, and so you need to maintain find i, right? So the idea is when you merge two things, you want to make sure that the root, the representative element, is the lower guy, is the lowest guy in your connecting component, right? Um, and the idea is that if you fill a bucket, right, if you fill up a, buck, a vessel you're, uh, and you flow down, you're, you want to merge that bucket with the guy below it, right? And so, so then that way your connected components are just series of full buckets and then one guy at the bottom who's not full, right? So, so the query, you either print the actual capacity if it's not full, or if it's full, then just print that it's full, right? And print it's the full volume. And otherwise, for the merging thing, you want this sort of diagram, right? Or you have sort of series of full and then one that's not full, full and not full, right? Um, and then when you're merging, and then let's say let's say you put into uh, into one of the things, it cascades down to the guy who's not full and starts filling it up, right? And then when you want to merge, you just do the DSU merge, um, and then make ex- except making sure to make this guy the child of the lower guy, and then everything's fine. Uh, everyone see what's happening? Cool, okay, let's go on to the next problem. Next problem you actually definitely need DSU for, so let's go on to the one. Okay, it's called ASEAN kittens. Um, so you're given a whole bunch of kittens, 10 of the 5th kittens, and they're all in cages. And these cages are separated by walls, as you can see in like this picture. Um, the issue is you don't know the initial order of the kittens, okay? Um, but you're also then, but you, what you are given are n minus 1 different operations. Um, and each in each operation, the walls be, uh, between kitten AI and BI are removed. Um, you also have to note that within a connected region, like once you remove some walls, and there's a bunch of kittens just in, a, in a region, they can mix around freely and move to wherever they want, right? Um, and so the problem is, is that you're given all these operations of removing walls. Can you um, give us one possible initial ordering of kittens? So let's look at the uh, example that hopefully clear things up for you guys. So let's say this was the initial ordering, right? We don't know if it, what the initial ordering was, but we're just looking at this one. Let's say this was the initial ordering. Then the operation 1, 4 removes the walls between kittens 1 and 4, and it becomes like this, right? Then you're given that, do you want to remove the wall between 2 and 5? So here, right? And so this becomes like this. <clears throat> then... Um, you're given the operation 4 and 5. So you're removing the wall between 4 and 5. Note here, 4 and 5 are not touching each other, but because these kittens in the pink guy in the pink segment can move around freely, right? this guy number 5 can, can like swap with 2. right? He can just move to the left wall, and then you guys can move the wall between 4 and 5. And so then everything merges. right? Note that after all n minus 1 operations, all the kittens have to be in the same component because there's n minus 1 walls in total. Okay, I'll just think of, I guess I'll give you guys a few minutes to think about ideas.
Well, I guess you can just like blob them up and put them together, right? And use a DSU tree to keep track of uh, them, basically. Right. So, so, so you have like one part of the solution, right? Is that so? Like, if you... for each, like you have the one for you put them together, you know, they have to be adjacent, and then you have like two to five, and you know that they have to be adjacent, and whenever. You like merge two bins. You have to like glue them together, and now they're like, okay, now you have a glued together section. Right. So, how do you glue them together? Is the question. Well, you can't. You just put them together, like just just put them together adjacent. Put the two blocks adjacent to each other. Because yeah, like it... before, every block is floating by itself, and when two blocks meet, you glue them together. And now they're a big block. And then when two other blocks leak, you glue them together too, and they're all one big block. You have the right idea. The problem, the question is just exactly how do you implement the gluing part? Because that's not maybe. I'm well, they use the DSU tree to uh, keep track of that stuff. Right. The know? DSU lets you figure out where the connected components are. Right. It lets you see that oh, three, one, and four are in the same connected component. But how do you like yeah. physically glue them to, glue them together in sense of ordering? Right. The DSU doesn't maintain any sort of order by itself. Right, it just maintains. Or no, you have system. something else to keep track of the order. Right. So the question where is you how? just uh, yeah. So the question is like, what do you have for that? A big array you're, where you just start together. gluing things together, or you have linked lists and you could link them together. That's so. One thing we like touched on a little bit is when you're doing like the small to large merging. Um, for each component, you're like storing its size, right? And then when you join the two components, you just set the size equal to the sum of the two sizes. So this is something that sort of comes up in DSU a lot, where you want to store some like uh, extra information for your components. So what kind of extra information could you store for your components here in order to glue everything together at the end? I mean, we could just have a an array that linked to every uh, linked to every tree, like every every tree root, and it has like it has every element of the tree on in in any uh, in whatever the order order is that you're using. And then when you merge trees, then just append the two uh, arrays together. Right. If you're if you're if they're arrays, <laughs> then that's linear time per merge, right? And that's so that's yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that link list is oh, probably more efficient for that. You could do uh, you could probably do small to big, and that would work out. That would also work out, yeah. So, but he also mentioned link list. Those... Link yeah. list is, I think, the one that we had, the solution that we had. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, kind of, kind of. It's not implemented the traditional link list, but it's, it doesn't it's... actually do the merging, but it sort of implicitly does it. Yeah. I think it's basically a link list with an endpoint. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Okay, that's good too. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So the idea is that we have. Um, we maintain this additional array uh, for each component. For each component, um, what we do is we have the rightmost, we store the rightmost k in that component. Okay? So this is, um, yeah. And we also, uh, and in, obviously we initialize the i because every component only has itself. Um, and we also have uh, this other element, other array, next i. Um, and this is for each specific k in, not the component, but each specific k in. What's the next guy in the initial ordering, right? And this is initialized a negative one to signify unknown. Um, and so this is sort of what you guys were talking about with the link list, I think. Um, so next i could be considered your link list. Um, and right i is like the sort of end point here for the link list, right? And so that gives basically shows us how to actually physically do it. Um, yeah. And so we also, but we also need to maintain that the root of each component is the head of our link list, right? It's the, left, it's the, it's the leftmost guy in your component. So that gives us very nice code to join. So when we're when we're uh, processing some operation, um, a b right, a comma b, uh, we do the following things. We first look at the roots of the components, right? Then we set. So if you look at we look at these two components, right? So let's say a and b are the roots of the components, right? Because we we found them using find. Remember which finds the roots of the components, and we said before the roots are are are, are we're sort of maintains invariant. The roots are on the leftmost part. So that's why I drew like this. Um, and so we do a, a couple things. So first, we set the right element of A, so whatever element is over here, we set its next guy to be this guy, to be B, right? To the leftmost of the next guy. 
And so this sort of glues the link list together, as you were saying. Um, but we also need to set the rightmost guy of A to the rightmost guy of B, right? Because since we've glued the link list together, now A is the head of this new link list, and its end pointer has to be what the old end pointer of B was. So we do that. And then finally, we do this parent thing to merge them together in the DUSU sense. Um, and so now A is the leftmost guy, the head of this link list, right? And so this whole thing relies on this sort of uh, this DSU part, right, to find which link list, right, each uh, element belongs to, and then and then we can do the merging, like you guys were saying. Link list. Everyone clear on how the code works? Okay, um, last thing to mention is that when we're printing it, we have to find the, uh, the actual head of the link list, right? Find the leftmost initial element, right? And we do that by this. We just find an arbitrary, pick some element, so in this case one, and just close find on it. That finds the root of its link list, right? Of its bucket. But there's only one bucket, so that's the root of the entire thing, which is the leftmost element, right? So we find the leftmost element, and then recursively call, or keep, uh, repeatedly call next on it. That gives us the pointers. And so that gives us our initial ordering. Okay? Cool. Okay. Next one is kind of interesting. Uh, this is less a problem and more um, another algorithm that depends on DSU. It's a kind of a famous problem. It's called the minimum spanning tree problem. Uh, and the idea is that you're given a weighted, connected, undirected graph, okay? Um, and what you want to find is you want to find some spanning tree, and a spanning, a spanning tree. Um, and a spanning tree is a tree that connects all the nodes in that graph, right? Um, and you want to find the minimum such spanning tree. Minimum in this case means the guy with the smallest total weight of edges. So you take the edges in the tree, sum them. You want this, the, the spanning tree that has the smallest such sum. Uh, here's an example of such a minimum spanning tree. You have this graph, and the highlighted black edges um, are your MST, minimum spanning tree, or it's called MST Wait. for short. Is it not? There's no way that's the MST. Right? I don't know. I just Googled the actual TBH. I don't, okay. I don't actually know if that's correct. Cause, cause like, if you look at the edges coming out of one, on like that side. Oh, yeah, it's clearly wrong. It, it's a spanning tree. It's not the it's minimum the, spanning tree, okay. but it's a spanning tree. Good point. Good, good catch, Joe. Okay, yeah, so this is an example of a spanning tree, right? So your spanning trees will always have n minus 1 edges, right? Because um, uh, trees with n vertices have n minus 1 edges. In general, that's, that's how trees work, right? Um, and it won't have any cycles, again, because it's a tree. Um, so it looks something like this, right? Um, and unlike this one, it'll be the one with the smallest sum of edge, edge weights. Okay, everyone understand what an MST is? Cool. Okay. Uh, anyone have any thoughts on how to solve it? Hint using DSU, or any just any observations about it? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. You, got, you probably guys probably won't be able to come up with the actual algorithm. It's not obvious. But even any observations would be uh, you want to think about. That'd be cool. Uh, I think there's some way we can like keep connecting the uh, like the connected components so far using uh, like the smallest possible connection between two connected components and then like somehow store that in a DSU. Yeah, so, sure. so you, you've got like half the answer. Okay, yeah. But yeah, you, you've got like half the answer. Um, uh, and, and the idea, of, uh, the, the, the first idea you need to think about is maintaining connected components. Um, and so this is a idea that's much more general than just uh, MST. This is a, a prop, a, um, an idea that comes up very often in graph problems. Um, and that is that you can use DSU to maintain connected components in a graph. Um, so yeah, so, so you should, this is something you should, uh, a big takeaway from this presentation. 
uh, more than just MST, is that you can use uh, DSUs to maintain these connecting points. Uh, the idea is that if you have some edge AB and you're sort of adding that edge to the graph, right, or you like think of like processing that edge AB, uh, what that corresponds to is you're joining the components that A and B are in, right? So if A is in some connecting component, B is another connecting component, right? The edge AB joins those connecting components um, and join in the DSU sense where you're merging two buckets, right? Um, further, if you want to check whether A and B are in the same connecting component, again, you can think of the connecting components as just buckets um, and uh, just check if they, they're, they're in the same bucket as you do with DSU, right? Um, and another cool thing you can do is this lets you check if adding an edge will give you a cycle or not, right? Um, given some edge AB, if A and B are in the same connecting component already, adding that will give you a cycle. Because you're already connected in one way, and now you're adding an edge to connect it the other way, so it's a cycle. Okay? So, um, and I think uh, Andrew came up with the next slide, so good job. Um, and so this algorithm is for finding the MSU skull known as Kruskal's algorithm. Uh, there are other algorithms that don't involve DSU, uh, but this one's very easy to code, intuitive, and like easy to remember and understand, um, and it uses DSU, so it's relevant. Okay. Um, and so the idea is so the idea is that you do this greedily. Um, I'm not going to give you the proof right now. If anyone wants to stay after, I can show you the proof. It's kind of cool. Um, but the idea is that uh, it turns out you can sort of form this MSC in a greedy way. Um, so what you do is, when I say greedy, and specifically, I mean that you can sort the edges by the weight. Um, and, and then you process them in order of increasing weight. And so for a given edge AB, if they're already connected, you can't take it, right? Because if, they're, if you're connecting two nodes that are already connected, you're being redundant. Um, you're forming a cycle, it's not a tree anymore. You're, you're taking an extra edge, right, that you, that you shouldn't be. However, if they're not connected, if they're two different connected components for A and B, then you do take that edge and you merge it. Um, and you keep on doing this until all the uh, edges, all the nodes are in the same connected component, um, aka this, the same tree, right? Um, and you do this until you take n minus one edges, as, as you would assume, because it's a tree again. Um, and this has um, complexity n log n. Um, first of all, you have to do n log n because you're sorting the edges, right? Um, but also then the DSU is also an n log n thing. I guess that should be m log m because number of edges, not by nodes, but whatever. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's not obvious why the greedy should work, but it turns out it does. Um, and you can like prove it by induction. But does everyone at least see if this doesn't necessarily form the smallest tree, at least why it does form a spanning tree that's kind of small, right? Okay, cool. So, so this is a cool algorithm, you should remember it. Okay, okay, next problem. Uh, this problem is called path queries. Um, and so the idea is you're given a tree, big tree, 10 of the fifth vertices, um, and the tree and each edge on the tree has some weight. And these weights are also less, less than 10 to the fifth, right? So you can, you can see your tree with weights. And then you're given a bunch of queries. You're given let's say 10 of the fifth queries, um, and for each query, your is defined by some weight wi. Um, and the idea is you want to return the number of pairs of vertices such that um, the path from u to v, so like from the path from u to v, has maximum edge weight at most wi. So notice it's a tree, so there's only one like path, so one one simple path, right? So that's what you can say the path. Um, and we, we want to, we want to find the pairs of vertices. Um, such that the maximum edge weight is most the w from the query, right? So for example, uh, this path, the maximum edge weight is three, because, you yeah, know, right? Uh, but for here, the maximum edge weight is only one, from one to four, right? All right so you need to find a number of such pairs for each query. And they, they also impose a u less than v, just so you don't double count, like, uh, u comma v and v comma u, but that's whatever, right? So if, if you query by one, for example, here, you can either go one to two, one to four, uh, or two to four, right? Anything else would uh, involve edges of sorry, size bigger than one. So that's bad. Okay. A, everyone understand the problem? And B, uh, again, I'll give you a few minutes to think about it.
Um, so you can just uh, make a list of make a list of every link and then order like uh, order by weight. So then, uh, so then, on um, if you if if the input is uh, input is wi, then uh, yeah, you you only look at the index indices that have a weight below wi and just count. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Um. So we have to so we have to return the pair the number number the number of links where you have um. Where you have a uh, like a max max size the max size rate below the below W one right? Not below number of w links. Number of links. Number of pairs of vertices in total. For example, for a query one, you can have one comma four. There's no link from one. Oh, the entire four. path. Okay. Yeah, the entire path has to match, uh, max weight, uh, max edge weight less than W I, and you want to return the number of pairs such that they have this nice path of of small edge weight. Yeah. So like, if you did a query for four in this example graph then any pair of vertices would be okay because um, all the weights uh, are at most four. So you can get from any vertex to any other without going over an edge of weight more than four. So can you like connect so you connect everything that is weight one and then you take the amount of you take the amount of things that have weight one and then you and then after like after you connect all the components for each component you count the amount of pairs that for that have like weight one. So like for example in this example, one, two, and four. And then if there was a separate component like I don't know, like eight and nine, you wouldn't yeah, you count between each each set instead of in total. And then you do that for two, three, all the way to 10 to the fifth, or whatever, how many weights there are. Uh, I think you're on, I think you have pretty much the answer. I think if I'm understanding you correctly. Uh, so it, you're, you're saying, you're, are you doing this before for each query or before before the queries? Uh, before. Before, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah you, you have you have basically the right idea. Um, yeah. So so the idea for this problem is similar to the the last thing for MST, not 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 the MST part, but the idea of maintaining connected components, right? A tree is, is still a graph, right? And so, so the idea is the same sort of thing as we can use DSU to maintain the connected components, right? Um, and so like PK said. Um, we, uh, we we want to loop over all the weights. Uh, since it's only 10 to the 5th, we can just literally loop from 1 to 10 to the 5th. Um, and what we want to do is that we basically want to s sort of pre-compute all the answers. And then for each query, we can just look up in an array. That, that's the sort of our goal, right? Um, and so the trick to do this is that as we maintain the connected components for each, um, like, for the, for the tree, right? Um, what we want to do is we also want to maintain the size of each component. Um, we, we sort of do this on a side array. Um, right. So what we, what we want to do is we sort the edges by weight. And we don't actually sort the edges, just like loop from 1 to 10 to the 5th. Um, and so for each edge in the tree of that weight, we can do the following. We can um, 
uh, look at the size of U and the size of V, right? Because it's connecting components U, the component that U is in, and the component that V is in, right? And note that these components cannot already be connected because it's a tree, so you can't have cycles. So you can't have components that connect in two different ways, right? So we, we look at the component that U is in, and we look at the component V is in. So this edge contributes paths, six paths, right? Because three times two, right? So you go from here to here, 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 or here to here, 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 right? Um, and so, and, and notice that uh, any of those pads could not have been done by a smaller wi, because this is sort of our bottleneck, right? This edge w makes sure that only queries with weight wi greater than equal to this w um, get these pads, right? So what we do is we take these number of pads, which is just size of u, size of component u, times size of component v, and we add that to the answer for w, and then we join the components like we do with dsu. Um, and we also merge the size values as we're doing the components, right? So, so before we, um, uh, and this is an important thing to remember, by the way, because uh, I remember I know Joe and Adam made this mistake before. Um, when you're sort of maintaining these side arrays, of, for example, size, or from the cat problem, you maintain right and next, right? You maintain all these these different arrays along with the DSU, right? You maintain information about the component in a separate array. Um, you want to m merge the information, these side information, before you merge the actual DSU part. Because otherwise, if you do the DSU part, you're just merging the information for the same component, and you're making an error. Um, so you want to merge the information first. In this example, you want to add the sizes first, and then do the actual DSU parent equals fine thing. Okay. Um, and so once all these merges are done, each ants W stores the number of pairs where the max weighs exactly W, right? Um, and then we just do a prefix sum for. Uh, on that array, and then that gives us how many are less than or equal to w. And so for each query, it's just look it up in, in the answer, in the prefix sum of answer. Right. Um, and, and so by the way, the code for this would look something like um, you sort the edges, you loop over the edges, right? And then you'd be like, okay, uh, size find u times size find u, and then time size, size find v, and then you add that to ants w. Right? And then you do your, and then you do your, and then you do your join, which is like, oh sorry, no, you, you do that, then you do size find u plus equals size find v, right, and then you do parent uh, find v equals find u. So so you look like those three lines. Uh, remember the, the important you have to keep track of which one's the parent at at the end of the join, right? Because that's the one who needs to have the updated size information. Right, so so uh, so example in, in this thing, right? If you do uh, size u plus equals size find v, so size find u plus equals size find v, that means you want u to be the new root, or, or find u to be the new root, right? And, and in that case, what you do, you have to do is parent of find v equals find u. So now find u is the root of, of the entire thing. Okay, everyone understand what's going on here? This isn't. Uh, I guess a few minutes to think about this, I guess, or. Or process this, or ask any questions. Okay, let's go on. Okay, this is the last problem. Um, it's quite a bit more, much more difficult than the uh, I think than any of the other problems we've seen. Um, and I think we did this on our previous five hours. If you know the answer, don't uh, <laughs> say it. But okay, so the problem is called mountaineers, and you're given a grid of size n by m, where n, n and m are less than equal to five hundred. So this is a grid, for example. Um, and here, each value in the grid represents sort of a, an elevation, a height in the mountain range or whatever, right? Um, and so you're, you're also given a bunch of queries. Uh, so for each query, uh, you're given two positions of the grid, so two coordinate positions, so x, y, y, y1, uh, x2, y2. So in this example, this is one x1, y1, and this is x2, y2. Um, and the idea is that you want to sort of take some path where uh, on, on this grid, where you can go adjacent, like right, left, up, down, uh, not diagonal. 
um, but you want to be uh, sort of minimize the maximum maximum altitude on your path. So for example, for this guy, this the yellow highlighted path is the answer. So here, very nicely, uh, the maximum altitude that you take is three. Um, any other path that you take, the maximum altitude would be like four. So if you go like the shortest path like from here to here, you take four. But that's bad. You don't want to do that much effort. You want your minimum, your maximum guy to be to as small as possible, and this way you can do it with three. Okay. Well, everyone see the problem? Understand? Oh, yeah, and like, yeah. or any observations also? Uh, we can just merge peaks together if they're below a certain height, right? So we just merge all the ones, and then all the twos, and then all the threes until we're done, right? How does that help with answer the queries, though? That's the sort of tricky part. Uh, or we have a graph of like everything that you can reach if you only go for one. And then, like, you keep track of all those. Uh, right, but then you have n by m graphs, right? Each of size n by m. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Because at worst case, all of the weights are different, right? So for each, you have n by m different types of weights. And yeah. n, n squared, m squared, which is way too big. <clears throat> Yeah, if we don't have space concerns, the only thing I can think of is uh, recalculating for every query. Right, so now that solves space concerns, but then you have time concerns, right? Now it's n by n by q. Yeah. Is there a constraint for the maximum altitude per um, square, or is it 500? Maximum, like the values in the grid? No, I don't yeah. think so, like 10 and 9 or whatever. Oof. <laughs> uh, but no, that shouldn't really affect anything because you can always coordinate compress if you have to like, right? Uh, the actual values don't matter, right? The, the, the fact that it's five minus three doesn't matter. Like the fact that they're two apart, it's minus five is bigger than three and five is bigger than four, right? If, if this five was replaced by 10 billion, it doesn't change anything in the problem. It's still the fifth biggest weight in order and, and that's all that really matters. So what that means is you can assume that the heights are like at most 500 squared. Yeah, yeah. I don't get a problem um, at that, it, but you can assume that. Yeah, and it it shouldn't really matter much for this one. I guess I'll give you guys a hint because without it, it's no way. Uh, it's probably uh, this is very hard to get. Um, is that you don't want to use a traditional DSU? You don't. You don't. Yeah. Smallest edge to it. Okay. Uh, so the hint, the hint I'm going to give you guys is that uh, you don't want to use a DSU we've been using before. Uh, you want the, uh, the the answer involved using this uh, small to big merging DSU, the, the union by rank. Which basically means that as we're doing the DSU, we want to be like physically moving things from one bucket to the other, like storing some kind of list.
here's another hint. Uh, the quarries are given to you offline, so we can probably we can process the quarries offline, uh, which means that we're given all. Oh, the that makes it much easier. Yeah. I mean, if you have all the quarries, you can just sort them and then uh, go through that. What do you mean sort them? Like, it can, uh, are we allowed to? Oh wait, no, no. Uh, sorry, never mind. I just. So that would still. Yeah. Uh, I just want to explain. Yeah, that. That when I said the queries are given offline, you can do the queries offline. That means we're given the queries all at once, and then we can get to solve them all at once in some way, and then print the answers out after we solved all of them. So that often in these types of problems uh, helps you do something fancy with how you solve the queries, as opposed to just solving them one by one. I was thinking of just merging them like by out to like put all the ones, and then like now you allow twos, and then merge them together. But uh, you still have to check after each want to see which queries now work. So uh, that takes a long time, right? So you're Checking only right yeah. each merge. Uh, not necessarily. If you uh, again, if we can just make a we can just make another uh, link drifter array and then just uh, and then just search in the uh, and then just search in the array if we use if we use like merge sort or something to make the array then we sh uh, it uh, it shouldn't take too much time to both sort it and search to see if a particular index is in there. Sort though. Uh, what did you say? The audio. Sort. What do you sort by? Oh. Um. I mean X. I'm assuming. Uh. Oh, uh, what was what were the restrictions on the size? On uh, five hundred. Okay. Yeah. So if you sort by if you sort by X, then you just like, then you just have to go through uh, five five hundred per query. So then that's um. Sorry. What? what? I'm not sure I understand you guys. Yo, uh, do you understand what you're saying? No, I don't think. Um, um, I was thinking of like uh, j just uh, I uh, look at all look at all the connected components that have um a certain min a certain max maximum height, and then just uh, keep incrementing that, and then every time every time you increment the maximum height, we um merge them like we did in the last problem, and we um. Maintain a and we maintain a uh, so, sorted sorted so, sorted array of which uh, of, um how do you say uh, well, which positions are in are in each uh, connected component. So whenever we merge, we just check uh, to see if like uh, we just check to see if um some something we've uh, uh, something is uh, that's in the queries is also in uh. In, you're, you're how do you say? Right answer, but the issue is how do you check which queries we answered? Right, just ten and fifth queries. How do you check it, at each merge? How do you check which one you just answered? Right, you're you're very close. You're very very close. Like to a, what you did. a slight tweak to how you're representing. Yeah. Wait, what if we have another DSU for the queries and we're like merging queries together or something? Again, you guys are cir I circling the right answer. I think I just to tell just give it. I guess you guys are like combine your guys' answers. Yeah, like, it was it was very close to yeah. the right answer. So okay, uh, okay. So yeah. Uh, so so the idea is um, you want to, as you guys are saying, sort the squares by height and merge them in increasing height order. So one, two, three, four, five, and then you know just go and, and sort of connect the components in height order, right? Um, but the the question is is that how do we find which queries right are solved at each position, right? Once you add let's say weight number five, oh you answer these queries now at this point. How how do you check that, right? Um, and so the thing is, is that uh, we want to use small to large merging instead of using a normal DSU. Um, and, and what this lets you do, what this small to large merging lets you do is lets you, as Joe said, actually physically move objects from one list or thing to another. Uh, unlike a normal DSU where it's just an abstract, like, oh, you just like merge these tree together in a very nice clever way. Uh, however, it doesn't let you actually physically move objects. But the small to large merging lets you physically move objects. Right? Um, so what you do is you make a graph, sort of, where uh, the weighted edge uh, between uh, any two squares um, is just the maximum of its vertices, of the, of the, two, the two squares, right? If you're going from this edge to this vertex to this vertex, right, you're taking, you're at least going to use the height of the maximum of the two, right? Um, and so, yeah, the second idea is to do all these queries offline, like we said. Um, and this is the critical part. This is similar to what uh, David was saying. And this is for each connected component, which by initially starts out as just individual vertices. We store the query endpoints 
in in that uh, connecting components. We store the indexes of that query. So if we read in, let's say, 10 to the fifth queries, right, we number the queries by the order that they came in at, right? And for some given query, xi, yi, 1, xi, yi, 2, we store i, the index i, um, in the two connected components. So in x1, y1, we store i, and in x2, y2, we store i, right? Then, we, as we said before, we loop through all the edges, right, in increasing order of weight. And then we take the two, two connected components of, uh, that it's joining, right? Um, and we join by small to large merging. So for each connected component, let's say we use a set, right, to maintain which query uh, indices are in there. So all the query indices are in, uh, for, for this guy and for this guy. And then we take the smaller guy and physically take their elements and move into the bigger guy. Elements, in this case, being query indices. Now, um, if any of these elements are already present in this bigger set, that means we just answered a query, right? That means we just finally are able to go from, uh, this, from uh, index i start to index i end. And we did this with whatever weight we're on currently in our for loop. So that means the answer to query i is whatever weight we're on in the for loop. Um, and then so, yeah, and if, if, uh, if the endpoint's not in there, then we just put it in there and keep on growing that like we do with normal small to large merging um, and, and just keep on doing that. Eventually, everything will be one connected component and all the queries will be answered. Um, and so uh, the time complexity for this is n by m because n by m merges because n by m different weights. I mean, each operation uh, takes log n by m time. Um, and by a movement, because as I mentioned before, that the whole analysis. Um, but because we're using a set, right, uh, a C++ set, to check whether or not, uh, like when we're putting one element to the next element, we want to check if that's already in there, right? So we can answer the queries. Um, that takes another log factor, so that's a log squared then. Uh, so Abneil mentioned something nice. Uh, I, I guess you can do that. You can use merge sort if you want, and that removes the log factor. If you maintain the list sorted and then just sort of merge them together, does it? No, that isn't actually. Never mind. No, that's not what you work. Never mind. No, it does work, right? Because then you can binary search for. Uh, no, 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 no. Because right? because the, you you still have to manipulate the big guy also, right? So you're not gaining anything. Oh, that's right. Yeah, never mind. That doesn't actually work. So yeah, you have to use like a a C plus stud set, and that's another log factor. Um, but this is still definitely fast enough. It's 500 by 500 by like 30, which is fast enough. Uh, does everyone understand what's happening? This is kind of a complicated problem, um, but it's a really cool like idea, and I guess I want you guys to understand it. Um, like I, I disconnected for a bit, so like just to confirm, so we're like for each for each uh, x where we're seeing like we're basically the uh, um, okay no for each for for each coordinate that's in that's in the query list we're more like we're we're making a list of those and if one of and if one of those is um, and if one of those is in a, in the merge operation then we check um, like if the other end, end point is in the uh, other set we're um, merging into and then if it is then we give uh, we put the answer to the query to be that. Oh. Yes, yeah, sort of. Sort of. The, the idea is that for each coordinate, for each point on the grid, we maintain its own like bucket, um, and in, in in that bucket, we store whichever queries start or end in that bucket. And so, when we merge buckets, eventually, yeah. the the buckets will have like duplicates. And once we have duplicates, yep. uh, At that point, we know we've answered the query. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and and notice that we had to use small to large merging here because. If you do the DSU merge, like the original tree merging, right, the, the fancy DSU, um, then we don't get to move elements physically, and so we can't actually check for duplicates in any way. <coughs> the, the small to large merging list is actually check for duplicates. Wait, is it that we have have to move them uh, move them physically, or is it just that uh, since since we already have to look at every single thing in the tree, we might as well uh, sort it to to make things easier? We're not sorting anything. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Not, uh, we might we might as well wait. So small to, small to large merging is uh, purely based on the size of the the size of the uh, tree, right? Yeah, the size of each each set. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, never mind then. Uh, yeah, the point is that we want to look at every single element when we merge, 
that's too slow usually. But if we do this small to large, it's called union by rank, by the way, in like actual textbooks. If we do this union by rank, that lets us do this physical looking at each element um, in a fast enough way. And the idea is we do need to also like physically move everything into the other set because we do need to maintain like this bigger set that contains everything in the two original sets. Um, so we do have to like physically move them for that. I, I guess if there's no more questions, uh, that, that's it for today. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, all these slides, again, as, as usual, are in the info channel on Discord. Um, do not have problems. I think uh, problems. problems are up. Uh, problems are up. Uh, there's not really any resources for this because, again, it's like a one-line template, basically. Oh. Um, but we, we have the problems from the slides, links to them at the end of these slides. Yeah. Yes, if you guys want to try coding this, these are here. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll see you guys next week, I guess. Yeah. Bye. If anyone wants to stick around and ask questions, that's fine too. Yep. Do you have the MST proof? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, let me, I guess, present paint or something of that, right? Yeah, sounds good. All right, bye. Okay. Cool. Uh, hold on. Hold on, is this working? Is it the tab? Can you guys see the tab? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, so you guys see why at least the first part is that crystal algorithm does give a spanning tree, right? That, that part should be obvious, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so all we need to show that it's the minimal spanning tree, right? Um, and, yeah. and, and so we do this by induction. Um, and so the, the property we want to prove by induction uh, is that for any given set of edges S, okay, at any step in the crystals, <clears throat> um, there's some minimum spanning tree that contains S. Okay, we, we want to prove this, okay? And so if we can prove this by induction, um, then, <clears throat> or prove this anyway, uh, th then that th this shows that, uh, and if this, this property maintains true, at the end of Chris goals, if this property stays true, as, if we prove it, um, then we find the minimum spanning tree because a sub we found a spanning tree that's contained inside a minimum spanning tree. So it has to be a minimum spanning tree by itself, right? Okay? Okay. Okay, so when in, okay, so let's prove the base case for induction. So base case is S is empty. Um, this is clearly true, right? Vacuously uh, contained inside, um, um, and, and, uh, whatever minimum spanning tree is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so now we want to prove the, the induction case, right? inductive case, right? So uh, we're uh, so the hypothesis for this for this inductive step is that S is subset of t, right? Where t, okay. t, t is some minimum spanning tree, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, in our crystals, we've sorted the edges, right? So we're considering some edge E1. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and we want to try to add E1 to S, right? That's, that's what crystal is doing, right? Um, so, uh, no, and, and if E1 is contain the cycle, let me skip it, right? Make a cycle, let me skip it. So let's assume it doesn't make a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so there's two cases. Either E1 is also in T, in which case we're good, the ES uh, union E1 is still uh, sub T, right? So the, the, the inductive step worked, right? Mm -hmm. Or it's not in T. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so what happens in that case? Okay. So, why would it not be in T? 
this is after all the smallest edge that's remaining, right? So what's the, what's the case if we're not, not in T? Well, the only way it cannot be in T is if adding E messes something up later, right? Uh, so so, so I, I guess the idea to think about is, oh, I guess there's a better way to think about this. Uh, if E is literally not in T, then T union um, E1 will cause a cycle. Yeah. Because T is a spanning tree, right? So it spans uh, all the all the nodes, right? So whichever nodes E1 is connecting, some nodes A and B, they're already connected by T. And since E1 is not in T, it's sort of doubly connected to them, which gives it a cycle, okay? Mm -hmm. um, that this cycle has to be a simple cycle, right? A simple cycle meaning it's just like a, like a loop, right? Like it just goes one on and out, right? It's not like doubling back on itself or anything like that, right? Because we've only doubly connected, we've not triply connected anything, anything weird like that, right? We've, we've, what was happening before T was like looking like this, and now E1 came along and just finished the, the, the loop, right? So that's just like a simple cycle like that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then we know, let's just call this cycle um, C, okay? This cycle C contains some edge E2, which is not in S. Do you see why? Because if uh, all the edges in C were in S, right? Then E1 plus E1 union C would also have a cycle. Mm -hmm. Right? And if E1 union S had a cycle, then we wouldn't take in the first place. That was our initial assumption, remember? That adding E doesn't cause a cycle. Right? Mm -hmm. so, whole, so then so then all of C can't be an S because uh, oh, but by the way when I say C I mean C is the one without the new edge so, so C, is, C is these three guys let's say right it's without E1 right but the point is C can't be an entirely an S because if it was then E1 added to S would complete C and then give you a cycle which we said won't happen by adding E1 so there has to be some E2 in C that's not an S okay mm -hmm. further we know that weight of E2 is greater than weight of E1? Yeah. Uh, why? Because we're processing in order of, the, by the way, crystals work, right? We're processing greedily, so that's literally the whole, the whole property is that E1 is the smallest guy we haven't taken yet. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so if you have, yeah, if you haven't taken it, then it has to be bigger. Okay, so then we consider the following uh, set. We consider T remove E2. Oh, well, greater than equal to, I guess, right? Sorry. Okay. Union the add the edge E1. Okay. This is still a, a spanning tree, right? Because we resolve the whole issue with the cycle. By removing E2 and then adding U1, right? We remove this guy. And even though if we added, even though we added this guy, it's fine now because it just goes like this. It's not, it's not, it's not connected anymore, right? It's not a cycle. So we, mm -hmm. we maintain the whole tree thing. We, we maintain, remove the whole issue with the cycle. Further, remember, since weight of E two is bigger than weight of E one, at least greater than equal to this, this guy's weight is is less than equal to weight of U, of T, the original weight of T. Do you see why? Because we're subtracting a bigger number than the number we're adding. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is weight is less than equal to weight of T. But since T was already a minimum spanning tree, uh, this has to also be a minimum spanning tree then. Yeah. Okay. Now, we also know that S is a, S U E1 is a subset of this. Because S doesn't contain E2, so removing this didn't, didn't do shit. Uh, S is a subset of T, and we added E1 to it, but we also added E1 to T to this guy. So S union E1 is also a subset of this guy. It's not also, it, it is only a subset of this guy. It's not a subset of T, that was all premise, right? In this case, so it's, it's, only a, it's a subset of this guy. But this means S union E1 is a subset of some minimum spanning tree, because we proved that this guy was a minimum spanning tree. So in either case, either this case or this case, S union E1 is a subset of some minimum spanning tree. I mean, that proves our inductive like step. And now we've, we take the inductive step all the way to the end, n minus one times, 
um, then we we, uh, we we find some subset S who is a I mean a, a, a spanning tree and a subset of some in a spanning tree, so it has to be itself in a spanning tree. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? It makes it's it's just, that's brain trippy. That makes sense. Yeah, the, the, the idea behind the proof is that uh, you can be greedy because internally, like, it'll fix itself by uh, any any decision you make. Sort of can't fuck you up enough to re- to remove you out of like sort of any decision you take greedily can't mess you up. Basically, is what we're showing. We're showing that even if it does seem to mess you up by removing by causing a cycle, it doesn't really because that cycle is a fake cycle. Um, with with an edge that's too big, and you can sort of remove it and then save yourself, and, and sort of not take it in the future and save yourself. It won't cause a bigger impact than one edge. The, the worst impact that taking a greedy, so this greedy edge you one can cause is that it'll force you not to take e two in the future. But that's okay because the whole point is we're sorting it. E two is bigger than e one, and that's all, that's all that matters. Mhm. Yeah, that, that's a good thing about it. Normally, the issue with greedy is that sort of taking the optimal answer now might screw you out down further in the road. This sort of, this idea, whole idea is that the worst thing to screw you up is that you don't take some edge E2 that has bigger edge than E1, so it's really not bad at all. Okay. That's cool. Hmm. Okay. Alright, well, this, me- this meeting's over, yeah, so... Yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs>